portrait photographer living in New York City, and most of my work is in the arts and humanities. I photograph writers. So you have this little bit of a more listening to the tricks, or like that. Very, very strong. One of the challenges we've had in our society today is that we're done. We're saturated. We have every possible image ever made. We have every composition ever made. There is a place on our planet that has been mapped, and our visual language is full. Everything's been said. So what can you do to get someone to actually stop and pay attention? With books, we have two opportunities visually to ask the potential reader and buyer to say yes to that request. And it's the cover, and it's the author portrait. At the very base of every photographic experience, I need to come up with an image that's elegant, compelling, engaging. The person looks seen, the person looks dignified, the person is strong, has a presence that will hold that readers, that buyer's attention, such that he or she walks out of the bookstore with that image. And that's usually a relatively safe image between the shoulders. That's what's needed. But if I have that time, then I'm going to push beyond that and see what we can create together. I'd like to go in the direction that makes sense for that writer. The first thing that goes into that storytelling is the research leading up to that moment. That research is reading that person's work. Hopefully have a conversation with that person before we dive into the picture. My getting a sense of that person's voice and, and discovering elements through reading the story that can hopefully speak to that person's story Finding those in real life and photographing the person against it, with it, whatever that case may be. That's no small thing. You're a great guy. Person up to great embrace. 
to be a part of this experience, book after book, writer after writer, and it's the joy of my life. Thank you all so much for being here, and I'm ready to show you more photographs, but I'm waiting for the keyboard to allow me to do just that. <laughs> well, and, until that, that arrives, Janet's just preparing the pictures. Hi, thank you so much, Janet. Wow, and now I can see all of you. You know, it looks so wonderful. Thanks for your smiles and for sharing your Father's Day uh, with me. I'm not a dad just yet, but maybe one day. But in the meantime, I'll enjoy the company of those of you who are, and those of you, of course, will soon be. Bear with me one second. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Well, it is, it is going. Okay, we'll back up just a little bit. Thank you for being here, everybody. My name is Beowulf Sheehan, and as you just saw, I'm a portrait photographer based in New York City, working in literary and, and arts and humanities, and I find my, my professional loves in celebrating people who have stories to tell. So uh, I have this book that came out in October of last year, author of the portraits of Beowulf Sheehan, and I'll share with you a few highlights of it. You're going to see pictures that were published in the book and some pictures from the same session that were not. So you get a bit of a better sense of the, the entire experience. And I'll share some vignettes with you. Um, Salman Rushdie kindly wrote the forward to my work. Uh, Salman is someone I've photographed now for 14 years time. If you don't know his story, somebody of course who had to disappear from public life for 10 years after a, a, a call was made to take his life uh, by the Atola Khomeini in the early 1980s. And I'm sorry, this is jumping forward. Um, is there a way to, to stop that? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. For all the times I've photographed Salman, who kindly wrote the foreword to my book, he has really struck me as a person whose strength, whose humility, whose sense of place, thank you very much, rests in his very face. I know of very few people who have suffered to the extent that he has, but for him to be there on the other side of that experience, and again, apologies for the technical difficulties here, for him to be on the other side of that experience and be so strong and be such a great advocate for those who have been in his, and perhaps are still in his formerly challenged position, is quite a beautiful thing. If there's a writer out there who's suffering, if there's a voice that's being threatened to be silenced or taken, he's among the very first few people I've ever met in my life who will be coming to that person's aid. And the image that you saw momentarily uh, just, just a second ago, to me, speaks to that strength that he's built within himself to be able to fend off any dictator any threatening voice, organized or disorganized, to challenge those voices. I'm so sorry. It's OK. Ready when you are. I'm just trying to get to the Sure. And while we're waiting, I want to take a quick moment to thank Mary, Dick, Theron, Maddie, and all the great people of the, of the staff and support here to make this weekend happen. This has really been a beautiful experience for me. Um, Despite my advanced youth, there's still plenty of things for me to learn and discover, and for me to finally discover this wonderful town this weekend is no small joy. Thank you for having me. Okay, very good, thank you so much. So now moving on, this is Donna Tart who graces the cover of my book. Donna, if you've not been familiar with her work, she's the author of a worldwide best-selling book called The Goldfinch, which is her third novel. It takes about 10 years for her to write each work that she's written thus far in her life. She has three. And before each experience with a, with a writer, I ask that person after reading the work how she or he or she or they wish to be seen. And I usually get the response, better than 90% of the time, I wish to be seen as a serious writer. Okay. But Donna was the only person in my life to answer with saying, I see myself as a dandy. Of course. <laughs> there was no styling involved here because this is her. All I had to do was find locations and textures that spoke to her. She approved them, and we went out and made them happen. Some people already have that persona about them. People who are public figures at some point have a persona. There's the private self, and there's the public self, the person and the persona. And she toes the line between the two very, very well. She is this beautiful. She is this present. She is this graceful. And this is how she carries herself every day. And this, of course, is the cover, and this was the back cover of The Goldfinch. If you've not read, it, not read it yet, I urge you to do so, because it's going to be a wonderful feature film coming out this September. 
Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison, of course, Nobel laureate, icon of the art form, wheelchair-bound person. And it's very important that with every person I photograph, that person is regarded with at the very least dignity, and we build from there. So I, in thinking about how to see her, I thought about President Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who, of course, had polio and never wanted to be photographed seen with that affliction. Seen, he never wanted to be seen wheelchair-bound. And all the strength we don't need to see in her body. The, that amazing presence of hers is in her face. It's in the texture of her hair. It's in the lines of her cheekbones. That's all I need. Cormac McCarthy. Cormac McCarthy has um, two gifts, if I may. Um, one is to, well, to scare you to death. But <laughs> the other is after that thought of finding poetry in the most damning, the most dangerous, the most awful experiences of the human experience, um, to speak about the love of a father for a son. So when I flew to Santa Fe to photograph him, I was told that he has two sons, and I'm allowed to mention one but not the other because he loves one dearly, and the other he's, uh, he has been estranged from such that um, I follow those guidelines. But there's this great mystery about him because the work at times is very, very difficult. If you've not read his work, then of course there are films like No Country for Old Men based on his work of the same name or The Road that perhaps you've seen. And there is this great, great darkness in which he writes so eloquently. There's this incredible strength in his face that I wish to show as well. But there's a great mystery about him. So how, with minimal resources, to speak to the, to the idea of mystery, to layers of a person? How can there be something so beautiful behind something so ugly? A screen door. Then traveling to his home after working at the Santa Fe Institute. So for those of you who have seen The Shining, you'll know that as that couple travels to that resort, Humanity disappears, buildings disappear, homes disappear, and it's just them on that long winding road. That's what it's like to drive to Cormac McCarthy's house. And we get there, and it's this beautiful two-story, 5,000 square foot of space with cars strewn about. And I found it very odd for him to be the only person in that home. And I asked him what all the cars were there for. And he said, well, they're mine. But they're under covers, just as you would put a boat out of season and under mooring cover. And I said, well, why all the boats, or why all the cars? And he had said, well, you see that one over there? That's a stingray, and that's from when I was in my 20s. And you see that one over there? That's, that's a cutlass, and that's from when I was in my ex whatever number of years. So the way we collect photographs as mementos of our journeys, he keeps his cars. And working in his home, it's New Mexico, so it's adobe, as you might imagine, speaking to this idea of darkness and light, working with what's available. I'm in his bedroom now. And this is a home with no technology. There's no Wi-Fi there. There's no electronics there. There's no television there. He writes on that typewriter. And just beyond the frame, he writes while seated in bed, just beyond the frame is a Tupperware basket into which he sets the pages after he's typed them. Uh, these are pictures made for a novel called The Passenger, which is now in its fourth year of being delayed. We'll see what happens. J.K. Rowling, very elegant, quiet, beautiful woman. Not much more to be said about her in that she's someone who's been, I should say very quickly, she's been photographed so many times that she needn't be photographed again. And I appreciate that having had the opportunity. But I could sense the discomfort with being photographed, and I told her she needn't look at me, if that made her more comfortable. She's still that beautiful. Patty Smith, I photographed Patty Smith four times, and uh, photographed her daughter now twice. And the thing about Patty is that when she walks in the room, you needn't see her to know that she's there. I think of myself as a layperson. I think of her as someone who lays just above someone like me. And to put that into a picture, to find that power, that grace about her, meant to me to find this is my favorite photograph in which she blinked. She's in another place. And we're happy to have a view to it. Carl of Anosgaard, amazingly tough face. Such a handsome figure, so bold, so rough and yet a gentle giant, incredibly shy. He speaks with his words, not with his voice. The previous picture is the one that's in the book. This is a picture that's not. This was a cover for a book that was published by Yale University Press. And so we made this picture at Yale. And moments after this, we had to go out and say hello to the people who were supporting us that day. And there was a cocktail reception, maybe about 50 some odd people about, and he was scared to death to meet them. And we were in a space such that it was a long rectangular room uh, with walls coming forward to accommodate an elevator shaft. And he and I were on one side, and all the, the patrons, supporters, and guests were on the other. And one by one, they came over and asked for permission to speak to him. It was a really touching thing, but that's how gentle he is. 
Ron Chernow. So I had the opportunity to photograph Ron Chernow for uh, his book, Grant. He took a good seven years writing Ulysses Grant's story. Of course, that book is now out in the world. And we chose a date that was convenient for the two of us, and we began at his home in Brooklyn Heights before working our way then on to location. So this is a picture made in his home, simple daylight, on the steps. And then we traveled to a place where we could make this picture, and that place happened to be this place. So I'm sure you all know who's buried in Grant's tomb, but if you don't know where it is, it's on the Upper West Side of Manhattan on Riverside Drive. And so as we made this picture, uh, the park ranger came over and said, oh, Mr. Chernow, so great that you're here. What are you doing today? Oh, I'm getting my picture taken for my book. Oh, how wonderful. Let me ask you a question, says Ron Chernow. Why are all the old glories on the walls today? Well, Mr. Chernow, you must know that today's Ulysses Grant's birthday. <laughs> so we're all capable of being human no matter how well-read we are. And for all the pictures we made that day, this is the author portrait, which we had made in about the first 10, 15 minutes of our experience together. We were about seven, eight hours time together. And I love that this is the picture that was chosen because there's no one Ron loves more than his late wife, and that's her sculpture in the upper left. Sorry, Joan Didion. So I had the chance to photograph Joan Didion on behalf of the New York Review of Books, and it was a really beautiful experience in that no words were ch exchanged between us. And when it came, all of the talking she did, she did with her eyes. And she looked at me and didn't look at me. And what I learned from that experience later on when it came time to publishing my book is, of course, the power of editors and making sure that you respect each other's voices and that you pay attention to the, to the encouragement of your editors. Mine wanted this picture to be in the book, and I respected that wish. But this is my picture of her that I love. She is this stark. She is this longing in her eyes. There's pain there. And then, of course, we all know it's also in her heart and her words. For all the pain that this man, Elie Wiesel, has, has experienced, there's also incredible grace and kindness there. Beautiful, loving man who I had the, uh, the opportunity to photograph twice. Uh, but after this time, this was the second time I photographed, and this is the time I wept. Neil Gaiman. So I photographed Neil Gaiman in 2007, and it was very brief. It was for Literary Festival. And I just introduced myself, hi, Neil, my name's Beowulf Sheehan, I'm the photographer for the festival, and I just need to make a quick picture of you if that's okay. Great, you said your name was Beowulf? Yes, oh, we were destined to meet. How's that? Because I wrote the screenplay for Beowulf. <laughs> so I, and it was coming out in just a few months' time, and I obviously hadn't done my homework, and I felt incredibly stupid, and I learned again the lesson that Ben Franklin had shared with all of us, that luck favors are prepared, so I fast forward to 2016, and I would have one hour to photograph him for Norse mythology, and we had to make seven concepts. Uh, we had to make the traditional photograph, as I alluded to in the film, there's that image. And then if you have time to create, we'll create. So making pictures that worked as metaphor to that book. And these we made in one hour's time in, in his land upstate. Uh, I recommend incense over cigarette smoke when you need to make this type of image in the future. Winged creatures, portals to doors to another world, or sorry, doorways, doorknobs to another world, and doors to another world. This, of course, is a theme that recurs in Neil Gaiman's work time and again. And the great thing about upstate is New York is that there's a lot of antiquing, and you can rent them. And this is, of course, what became the author portrait. There's a story within the, the myths in which uh, Loki summons the land and, and the gods uh, to, to challenge the gods, and the trees come to life to help lay siege with the golems to the gods. And these, this beautiful tree and, and the many of them beyond them, uh, beyond this one, seem to be coming to life at Neil's command. Jasmine Ward. So I had the opportunity and honor to photograph Jasmine Ward for her book, Sing Unburied Sing, which won the National Book Award. She's uh, for that, with that book, she had won, uh, in winning the award, she became the first woman in the history of the National Book Awards and the first person of color in the history of the awards to win the National Book Award for fiction twice. We only had about 20 minutes together, uh, yet this is made in my studio because this little person was long. And so her editor was holding Brando in the time that we made our pictures together. And at the end of the photo shoot, she's ready to go. And I said, Jasmine, I just have a quick question for you. Why the name Brando? I find that really curious. Oh, well, my partner and I just thought it'd be nice to have a, a name for our child that began with letter B. And I said, any thoughts on Beowulf? <laughs> no. Christopher Hitchens. 
Sir Christopher Hitchens, of course, we lost a few years ago, England's greatest intellectual uh, in recent history. And for those of you who might know his work but don't know his life, he's very much the Kurt Cobain, and to my thinking, of literature. An incredibly gifted mind, and also someone who couldn't help himself. Party after party, out late, late nights, every, every night, that sort of thing. He was, when, the day we made this picture, he had been out until 4 a.m. in a different city the night before. And it shows. And four, we four weeks after we made this picture, he told the world he had cancer, and then we lost him four months later. Masha Gessen, uh, this country's expert on all things Russia, uh, perhaps Russia's most famous LGBT community citizen. Uh, sorry, um, uh, not a citizen. She's a citizen of the United States. She came here in her teens, uh, but to hail from that country. And when she went to Russia to cover the legislation being passed, that it is now legal to brutalize people of that community in Russia. Uh, she herself was assaulted, and she survived that attack. But you can see just how strong she is. And I found it oddly curious that in her home, she has the color red on the walls, of course. Terrell Alvin McCraney. For those of you who don't know this gentleman, he is the, the department uh, chair of uh, drama at Yale. But he's also a playwright who wrote uh, a, a, an autobiographical play called In Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue, which became the film Moonlight. And so I was told last minute, this is an award ceremony for PEN America that he would be there and would I make a quick picture of him. I didn't have anything too sophisticated with me, but I bled in the exit sign light with a slow exposure to approach the colors of the movie poster. Brett Easton Ellis. So sometimes that beautiful image comes to you and it's such a gift. And I get up to his home in Los Angeles, take the elevator up and he's got a very simple one bedroom condo. And there are two doors, one to the kitchen and one's the main entry door. I get to that first door, the door is open, and there he is holding a knife this long. And I think, oh, this is perfect. This is the American Psycho movie poster all over again, and it's him. And he's cutting flowers. It couldn't be better. And of course, he then says, are you Beowulf? Yes, I am. Next door. I'll catch up with you when I'm ready. He then goes on to tell me he's a little self-conscious about his body. We make do with what we can. We honor those with whom we work. The customer is always right. And this is the image that became, became the winner. Ian McEwen, I had the honor of traveling to London and then driving four hours in the rain thinking I'm going to have no picture whatsoever in this experience with, with Mr. McEwen. And as we arrived into uh, Gloucestershire, I think it was called, uh, we uh, saw the clouds disappear, the skies open. Our shoes got, of course, quite soft. But to walk on the grounds of Mr. McEwen's home is to walk through, is to walk through his work. He, he is, to my thinking, the literary voice of the landscape of England. And then to see it firsthand as he lives it is quite striking. Uh, this is where he writes. Um, slate everywhere. Leslie Jameson. Leslie Jameson I photographed for a memoir called uh, The Recovering. It's about her history as, with alcoholism and also a history of alcoholism through writers and also the, the nascence and history of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I thought to make, of course, the picture that I had to make for the publisher and for her. These ran with different editions in different countries. Then a little more quiet pictures. She's come to a place of great peace, having had this experience now behind her, but also then trying to come up with a metaphor for the idea of overcoming addiction. So here we have a gray wall faceless, the void of addiction, the loss of yourself. And yet she is so colorful, so vibrant, with that danger forever behind her, but very much behind her. She's actually pregnant in this image. And um, her child was born last year. So um, this is Scott Cheshire, a writer who's not that very well known. But I thought to share this vignette with you in that Scott is someone who's written a novel called High as the Horse's Bridles. It's about a young man coming of age with parents who are evangelical, and he's not sure of himself as he gets deeper into his teens if that's the world for him or if there's another world out there that is for him. So of course, the picture I need to make for the publisher and for the book. And then trying to speak metaphorically to the idea of a higher power, this other world that he may or may not be open to embracing. So, and a handball court looking skyward. Angelic lighting from a street lamp, doing what we can. My lighting complemented with that angelic lighting. <laughs> And then, finding this location and telling Scott, OK, I have an idea. You can have one foot in one world and literally one foot in another if you walk out of that portal. It's about six feet up. 
and the, I had scouted it before and shown it to him. He was all in. The day we get there, there's a mattress on the block. I mean, those are the gifts of New York City, of course. Who knows what's in the mattress such that it's on the block, but that's another story. So he, I said, I don't want you to hurt yourself. I want you to land safely. Why don't we just pull this over and then you can land on it? No. Okay, I want you to land safely. When you hit the ground, roll. Okay, or we don't do this at all. I'll, I'll be fine. We make the image. He lands both feet firmly planted on the ground, falls to one side. And from that moment, we then made this picture and this picture. And then we walked back to, our, to my studio, packed our things, said our goodbyes. And a month later, I gave him this print. The, the author portrait was already delivered. And I gave him this image as a thank you. And much to my surprise, he opens the door, not with one foot on the ground, one foot in the air, but one foot on the ground, one foot in a cast. <laughs> Such that he had broken his ankle. And I just thought, I love what I do, and now my life is over, and I'll have to find something else to do with my life. I'm emotional, he's emotional, and he said, Beowulf, I can't thank you enough because I was behind with so many things. I've not had enough time for reading and writing, and now all I can do is read and write. <laughs> thank you. That's him jumping out of that door. He is stepping out of it. We helped him get up to it, and all he did was step out. It's about uh, 10 inches deep. Very brave. <laughs> so I think from here, uh, sorry, one more, one more story for you. This is Vanessa Veselka. Vanessa Veselka is a testament to the will of, of man and woman. And, and what you're seeing here is someone who had been homeless, someone who was a high school dropout, someone who had to do, how shall I say, unsavory things with her body to support herself for a while. She's a victim of, and survivor of sexual assault, but she's also a college graduate. She's also a publisher of a prize-winning novel. And what tattoo you see on her arm is that of the, li uh, the New York Public Library recorded number of her book, her achievement, that proud. Nothing's impossible. I thought I'd share with you, so these are a lot of pictures I just shared with you that had hit home to me. Of course, of course, they, I love them so much that they're in the book. And these are pictures that I hope hit home to all of us because you're now going to see pictures of people who've presented at this festival in the past. Um, and I apologize, of course, uh, this is, can anyone help me remember the name of this young lady here? Uh, this is Anne Leary. Sorry, it took me a moment. She's presented here. Ishmael Bea. Andrew Solomon. Sebastian Junga. Marlon James. Anne Hood. Uh, Nicole dennis Ben, Min Jin Lee. Um, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Uh, she lives on my block, so I'm really in trouble now. <laughs> uh, the poet who, who is actually, uh, does anyone re help, help, help? Anyone recall her name? I'm so sorry. Um, I will never live that one down. Uh, Mbolo Mbuye, thank you. Uh, David Means, Danny Shapiro. And of course, I'm, we're now at the tail end of this wonderful weekend, so I thought I'd share with you pictures of some new friends of ours. Madeline, Ben, Rowan, Rebecca, John, Essie, Elliot, Lee, Elliot and Lee. <laughs> Thanks for the bathroom, Mary. <laughs> Kirk, Alex, thank you so very much for a wonderful day. This was just two hours ago. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yes. What do you think about that? Absolutely. So for, I had a, um, a mentor named Nigel Perry, he's one of the great portrait photographers alive today, 
And he had said, there's the picture you need to make for your client, and then there's hopefully the picture you make for yourself. And so I, I absolutely make eye contact pictures. However, I also feel, as I alluded to in my film, that there are so many pictures out there in which that happens, such that I think variety is a good thing. Having something that's unexpected is a good thing, and maybe we're at the point then when we remember the differences, but not the homogeneity. And is it different for a well known person like J.K. Rowling, what we already know? That sure. That sure, there's more creative latitude just because they've already been so well established visually, yes. Great question. Yes. Hello. How much time do you ask for for a shoot? How much time do you get? <sighs> uh, I'll take as much as I can get. And usually we get to a point emotionally or physically where we know we're done. I'm, I'm happy to keep going and going and going. There's, there's new creativity to be found on every corner for working on location. And in studio, I can keep moving lights around and find, trying to find new ways of seeing. Um, but I, I always respect the wishes of my subjects. So Oprah Winfrey was on the screen in the film and I had 90 seconds with her. Um, I, had some, I had a photo shoot last night with uh, Kirk back there. I think we took about four minutes. And I've had photo shoots with authors somewhere in the neighborhood of seven, eight hours. It varies. Yes. Oh, that's um, kind of you. Did everyone hear the question? So Mary had asked, how did I, that, that I have multiple voices within me and how did I choose this? How did I see this as being my path? Um, I'm a very shy person and the camera made me stronger. And I didn't see that writing did that for me, that other art forms did that for me. So I found my place. Yes. Well, and he said, you know, maybe you can use this technique sometime. He said before he would photograph Roy, Roy wanted to stand on his head. So he'd stand on his head for a little while and then get up and he'd have that sort of fresh blood in his head. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there, are, there are photographers who get their subjects drunk. There are photographers who um, uh, will butter them up with jokes, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't do either. I, I don't think of myself as a funny person, certainly not proactively funny. Um, I, I do, you're making me think of an experience. Uh, one of my mentors is a photographer named Platon. He's an incredibly important portrait photographer. And he, and he photographs Christopher Walken. And Christopher Walken took over the shoot saying, OK, here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to turn away from you. And you're going to say, hey, Chris. And then I'm going to say, hey, what? And then I'm going to look back at the camera. Um, I want everybody to be comfortable. And if someone has a certain something about themselves such that that's what needs to happen before I push the shutter? Sure, sure. I did photograph not a writer, but a person in politics who between every frame had to do this. <laughs> now I'm ready, you may take the picture. Wow. Okay, customer's always right. Any other questions? Yes. I, I'm very, very grateful it's on the birth certificate. So the question is, uh, does my name have any impact on my life, I suppose? It's greatly, greatly. I'm, I'm very grateful to my father and my mother for saying yes uh, to the suggestion for having it. Yes. Thank you. Life would be, I, I can't imagine what life would be otherwise if my name were something a little more common, but I'm grateful for it. Yes. Any other questions? Well, thank you all so very much. This has been such a joy.